Dear learners, welcome you all to e-learning platform. This is week 7. In this week, we are going to learn about the critical appreciation of the poem, the long epic poem, satiric epic poem, Don Juan by Lord Byron. Me first learned as usual throughout the whole lecture with you. Faculty member, Department of English, World University of Bangladesh. Let's begin. Critical Appreciation of Don Juan by Lord Byron Major themes First, we are going through the major themes of the poem Don Juan The major themes are family, gender issues, sex, youth education okay so these major themes now we are going to discuss in detail first of all family lord byron was born into a pretty posh family and he knows a thing or two about how to raise a spoiled child he puts dungeon in the same position in his poem early in dungeon saying that DJ or Dungeon, DJ is for Dungeon, is basically a little brat who gets everything he wants from his parents. Byron is quick to warn any would-be parents that they should avoid making the same mistakes and instead use good, old-fashioned discipline to bring up their children. This advice is pretty ironic, considering that Byron famously lived his Live with very little discipline or at least very little restraint. Gender In a poem where Byron makes women into sexual aggressors and Don Juan into a passive lover, there are bound to be some interesting points about gender rules and sexual education. For starters, Byron intentionally reverses the traditional stories that portray Don Juan as an adult male who travels around seducing women. The Don Juan in Byron's tale plays a traditionally feminine role by being passive while all sorts of women try to conquer him sexually. By doing this, Byron shows us how absurd it is to think that one gender is naturally more sexual or aggressive than the other. These types of stereotypes shift throughout history and there's no good reason to believe that men are naturally this or women are naturally that when it comes to sex. Sex. If you have heard the expression, he is a Don Juan, before you know that a Don Juan is a guy who gets lots of sexual attention, traditional stories tend to show the character of Don Juan as a middle-aged womanizer. But Byron turns the story on his head to show Don Juan as an innocent young man who has trouble fighting off the advances of women. There's Byron's sense of humor for you. In a time when men are clearly the sexual aggressors, Byron saw fit to make his main male character into the object of women's sexual desire. Don Juan can only resist for so long before he gives in to some of these women. But who are we to judge him? Byron asks. Was the son of the handsome and profligate Captain John Byron and his second wife, Catherine Gordon, a Scotch heiress? Yot. On several occasions in Donju and Brock, Byron makes a point of reminding us that DJ is just a young, an inexperienced man. He does this to make Don Juan come across as an innocent observer in a world that Byron is dead set on ridiculing at every turn. 
Wherever we look, we find older people who are hypocrites, murderers, and cheats. But Don John always seems to rise above this stuff because he is so young and removed from all the corruption of the 19th century world. Education. Byron is concerned with the question of childhood education because he thinks it's the main reason why people become bad or good adults later in life. This is true for Don Jun, whose doting mother raises him to be selfish and conceited. Don Jun is a good guy deep down, but he carries the traces of his selfish pride straight into adulthood. For Byron, people often turn out well in spite of the poor education they received as children. In his mind, children should be treated with all the respect of adults and given the freedom to draw their own conclusions about life. Otherwise, they are just going to recreate the problems of their parents generation and Byron thinks there are plenty of those to go around now we are going to turn to form and structure of Don Juan let's know about the form and structure of the poem Don Juan by Lord Byron this poem is written in iambic pentameter an autoverima. Byron chose a very specific poetic structure known as autoverima. So autoverima, what is autoverima? Autoverima is just the term used to describe a poetic form whose stanzas have eight lines or autova and follow an A B A B A B C C rhyme scheme. That is called autoverima. So this structure is used by Lord Byron by Lord Byron to write his poem Don Juan, which is more than 5,000 lines. This structure involves a rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, A, B, and C, C, where each letter stands for a lines in rhyme. It's also written for the most part in a rhythmic pattern called iambic pentameter. Put simply, iambic pentameter involves lines of five five means penta and iams which are two syllable pairs in which the first syllable is unstressed and the second is stressed making it the dum bit the dum the first one is unstressed and the next second one is stressed this pattern holds throughout the poem with the exception of a syllable here or there Now, we're going to describe about the speaker in the poem Dungeon. Speaker in Dungeon. Many critics agree that one of the best parts of Dungeon is Byron's sassy speakers. Take, for example, the lines where he says, But if there's anything in which I shine, it is in arranging all my friends' affairs, not having of my own domestic cares. In this section, Byron's speaker says that he meddles with other people's lives because he has nothing better to do. This comment would have hit home with a lot of English readers since English culture in Byron's time was rife with gossipers and busybodies. As the poem continues, Byron's speaker gives more clues to make us think he is Byron himself. At the beginning of the canto 4, the speaker says, Some have accused me of a strange design against the creed and morals of the land, and trace it in this poem every line. Here, Byron seems to respond directly to critics who accused him of <coughs> writing failed in his earlier Don Juan Cantus. Now it's never a good idea in poetry to confuse his speaker with the actual biographical author. Setting up Don Juan. 
time and place. Don Juan covers an awful lot of ground in this poem. DJ has to leave Spain because he has an affair with a woman whose husband wants to kill him. So the first setting is Spain and then Italy. Then he travels to some Mediterranean island where he has a sexual relationship with a girl whose father sells him into slavery which takes him to Turkey. But just wait a second because Turkey is in, invaded by the Russian army and DJ follows them back to Russia. Finally, Russia's impress sends him to England as a sort of ambassador. So the settings are various places, starting from Spain, then Italy, then Turkey, then Russia, and then England. Byron wanted his poem to be as epic as possible, and that means sending the hero to all sorts of ex exotic locations. It makes total sense that Byron eventually brings DJ to England, though. After all, England is the main target of Byron's attire, as we see in a line like, If Britain mourn her bleakness, we can tell her the very best of vineyards is the cellar. In other words, Byron mentions that Britain often has overcast weather that nobody seems to like. But he reminds them that the climate can be good for certain plants to grow in. Mermaids in Dungeon Mermaids have been around in European stories for a really long time. Their traditional job is to lure ships toward jagged rocks by looking all beautiful and then causing the ships to wreck and sink. But over time, mermaids came to symbolize a sort of sexual virtue because man could never reach them. And that's the kind of meaning Byron is playing on when he writes or say they are like virtuous mermaids whose beginnings are fair faces in smear fishes. Not that there's not a quantity of those who have a due respect for their own wishes. Now it's important to remember that even while he praises the mermaid's beauty, Byron reminds us that their bottom half is just pure fish. Or in other words, our idealized versions of women might not always match the reality of what lurks under the surface, or in this case, under the water. The Black Friar in Don Juan. Everybody likes a good ghost story, so Byron decides to indulge Indulge us in the final cantus of Don Juan by introducing a ghost of his own that he calls the Black Friar. As Lizen goes, this old monk was ordered to leave his monastery and refuse. One thing led to another and the dude ended up dead, but he returned to patrol the monastery many years after his death. Lord Henry thinks that the black fire is jolly good fun, as he tells Juan at breakfast. Just beware, beware of the black friar, he still retains his sway, for he is yet the church's head, whoever may be the lay. Cannibalism in Dungeon What would an epic poem be without a shipwreck and some casual cannibalism? Yep, Don Juan's boat goes down in the Mediterranean and he ends up starving in a lifeboat with some other man. The others start eating each other but Don Juan holds back. And according to Byron, this was a good idea because all the cannibals eventually go crazy. For they who are most ravenous in the act, went raging mad, Lord, how they did blaspheme and foam and roll with strange convulsions wrecked, drinking salt water like a mountain stream.
Kissing in Dungeon. If there's one thing that Byron is willing to be serious about is the physical expression of love between a guy and a girl. In moments where two characters are kissing, Byron drops his satirical tone and gets pretty serious, saying, A long, long kiss, a kiss of youth and love and beauty all concentrating like rays into one focus kindled from above. Such kisses as belong to early days. It's this kind of seriousness that actually makes a lot of readers sympathize with Byron. At the end of the day, Byron thinks of physical love as the opposite of hypocrisy. It might even be the most genuine thing two people can do in this world. Allusions in Don Juan or implications. So there are literary, philosophical, and historical allusions uh, we may find in this poem. So the literary and philosophical allusions and references are Robert Saudi, William Worsworth, John Milton, Plato, Jean Jacques Rousseau, Socrates, Homer, John Keats, Miguel de Cervantes, Don Quixote. And historical allusions are Isaac Newton, William, Wilberforce, Thomas, Malthus. That's the end of the lesson of week 7. Thank you very much for being with me. Bye-bye.